Hello and welcome to Cabrumer and Aquarium's Discovery Lecture Series. I am Julie Passarelli, the Education and Collections Curator at Cabrumer and Aquarium. Cabrumer and Aquarium is owned and operated by the City of Los Angeles Department of Recreation and Parks, and we are extremely grateful for the city's support. I would also like to thank the Aquarium Director, Chrislyn McCarran, and the Programs Director, Jim D. Pompey, for their support. And a huge thank you to everyone who has joined us tonight. The aquarium remains closed due to COVID-19, but please check back on our website for any new information about opening dates and our online programs. Before we get started, I would also like to thank and acknowledge the friends of Cabroom and Aquarium for their support. Although the aquarium is closed, the aquarium gift shop is open on Thursday through Sundays from 12 noon to 6 p.m. We also have an online store and you have the option to pick up or ship your purchases. Your purchases support the aquarium and will help us get through this tough time. You can find the link to our gift shop on the aquarium website homepage, kabroomandaquarium.org. We plan to continue the lecture series this spring 2021 online. The upcoming lecture is on Friday, April 9th. 2021. And our speaker will be Dr. David Cummings from Point Loma Nazarene University in San Diego. The title of his talk is Just Say No to Drugs, the Spread of Antibiotic Resistant Bacteria into Our Coastal Wetlands. After that, the next lecture will be on Friday, June 4th. And the speaker is still yet to be confirmed. The schedule and speakers for 2021 and all past lectures from 2014 through 2020 are posted on our website. There's a link on the home page under news splash called Discovery Lecture Series, and that will take you to the upcoming schedule and the links to the past lectures. You just need to scroll down to archived lectures and you'll see links to all the lectures going back all the way to 2014. If you're interested in the up upcoming lectures, check our website for details and to RSVP to receive the webinar link like you did tonight. But again, a reminder, all spring 2021 lectures will be online. It is my pleasure and honor to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Andy Leising. Dr. Leising is a scientist at the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration National Marine Fisheries Service or NOAA Fisheries at the Southwest Fisheries Science Center in La Jolla and Monterey, California. He received a degree in biology and marine science from the State University of New York at Stony Brook and his doctorate in biological oceanography from the University of California, San Diego, Scripps Institution of Oceanography. His research there focused on the ecology of marine crustaceans and their behavioral responses to environmental variation. His current research focuses on the responses of fish and zooplankton to climate variability and the characterization of oce oceanic variability, i.e. marine heat waves, to climate change. He is part of NOAA's California Current Integrated Ecosystem Assessment Team. The title of tonight's talk is Marine Heat Waves of the Northeast Pacific. Will blobs be the new normal? Please help me welcome Dr. Andy Lysing. Uh, great, thank you. I just before I start, can you you can hear me? Okay, Julia. Yeah, I can hear you. Great. Okay, great. All right, let me launch right into it then. Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, glad to be talking with you tonight. So as you can see, my question here will be: Are these things that we've started calling blobs, these big marine heat waves, are they going to be the new normal? So let's jump right into it. So just a general outline of what I'll talk about. First, I'm going to give you a little background about what is a marine heat wave. Then I'll talk more specifically about what was this thing we referred to as the blob. I'll try to give you a little bit about why do we even care about these heat waves. And then at the end, I'll try to wrap up by talking about whether we think these recent marine heat waves, will this be the new normal that we see going forward or not? Okay, so what is a marine heat wave? A marine heat wave is basically any time and place in the ocean where the temperature is greater than a certain threshold for at least five days in a row. And this is a, it's a, a, a 
statement we've kind of taken away from the people who work in terrestrial uh, world with atmospheric heat waves. So we're following a same kind of analogy that would be used to determine it's a heat wave in Southern California, okay? And what we're looking at here is a picture from satellite of ocean temperatures. So what's important though is that there's a basically a threshold that we have to say above some threshold, that's when the water is warm enough to say that it's a heat wave. And we define that threshold based on what we think the, temp the temperature is normally like at any particular spot in the ocean on that day of the year, okay? And for practical considerations, we usually say that a heat wave is when the water is warmer than 90% of the measurements we've ever taken at that particular spot at that particular day of the year, okay? So just to give you a little more of a concrete example of what this looks like, I'll switch to a laser pointer here so you can see my mouse a little bit better. So what I'm showing here is a graph of the temperature of the ocean surface over the course of about three years. And this was probably taken uh, daily from a, and from a satellite. And the blue line is essentially this thing we call the climatology, which is the average temperature at that location on that day of year. So the blue line here is the same over all three years, okay? And that's called the climatology. Now, if we look at these other parts of the graph, we see that the difference between the climatology and the actual temperature, that's what we call the anomaly. So if you can see my pointer, hopefully the total distance between the blue line and the top of where the actual temperature is, which is the black line squiggling around through here, that is what's called an anomaly in temperature, okay? And then lastly, we refer to it as it being a heat wave whenever this anomaly is higher than some threshold. Again, that threshold is the 90% number, okay? Which on this graph is the little green line. So all the times when it's been a heat wave at this particular spot is wherever it's color-coded red on this map. And that's how we define a heat wave. So the next step is then taking a picture, this is again, this is data that's taken from a satellite. And we can basically take the satellite data and make daily images of what the entire ocean looks like. And now I've, here I've just zoomed in sort of in our local region, the Northeast Pacific. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go through a little movie for you to see what it was like over the last couple of years during this event that was called, we've kind of called it the blob. So the blob is talking about the specific heat wave that you'll see actually people refer to as being anywhere from 2014 to 2016, but it really, it started in 2013. So I'm gonna start this little movie going and you'll see. The important thing to notice on, this, on this, this movie is that this is not the absolute temperature, but this is the temperature that we're calling the anomaly temperature. So basically what you're seeing is how different is the temperature from what it usually should be. So if it's kind of green, then that means the temperature is what it usually be on that day of the year. But if it gets up into the red, that means it could be three or four degrees warmer than it should be on that particular day in that particular spot. So now I'm gonna roll the movie and we'll just watch this so you can see, see the blob as it rolled in and hit the coast. So here it goes. Okay, so it's starting to form. It's the fall of 2013. And at this point, this was really not on most of the oceanographer's radar as far as this being a big event that we need to worry about because we really had not seen these kind of events come out of that part of the ocean before. Okay. But starting in 2014, around this period of time, we did start to realize, hey, there's something going on. We better start paying attention. And this thing is getting awfully close to shore over here. At the same time, at around this time of the year, we were also starting to predict that there was supposed to be a, a giant El Nino hitting our shore, which ended up not happening. Instead, we got the blob. So I'm gonna keep, keep rolling the video here. And you'll see it kind of waxes and wanes during the spring, but then bam, a few times it hits the shore, okay? Gets all the way into the coast. This is still summer, 2014. Okay, it kind of gets bigger and smaller. Sometimes it's in the south, sometimes it's there, but it's just steadily growing in size okay, until about this point here. Oops, I'm sorry, I went back too far. Wait. Okay, so here we are in 2014, December. This is the winter time, January, February. 
Now, this is one of the most amazing features of what happened with this event, the blob. We had these incredible warm waters in 2015 that stretched up and down the entire coast. And we had never really seen something like this. The only thing that comes close to this is when we have big El Ninos. But I can tell you that El Ninos really only go out a couple hundred kilometers of offshore. This is stretching uh, almost a thousand kilometers offshore. So this was an unprecedented event that we really had not witnessed before that's much larger than most El Ninos, or in fact, any El Ninos we really know of. Okay, so it stuck around through 2015, almost the whole year, it was snuggled up against the coast. And then it kind of started splitting up there are little cooler waters in the, in the shelf off of Oregon. You can see the blue there. Okay, but then it came back towards the end of summer. And eventually it starts to dissipate around November and December. And there it goes. And that's it. Okay, so that was that was this one big green heat wave called the blob that really got us starting to pay attention to these things and we're starting to worry about how this was going to be affecting the animals and the plankton and everything else in our coastal ecosystems. So this is the part where I'm going to try to talk a little bit about why do we really care about these heat waves? What do they do to our ecosystem? So one of the most notable things was there was just a ton of strange and unusual happenings that occurred all up and down the west coast of the United States. So we had things like these uh, tropical poisonous sea snakes coming ashore in San Diego. We had a ton of bird die-offs all up and down the coast. We had these poor little guys, the Guadalupe fur seals that were being stranded. We had moa moas coming into the shore all the way up to Alaska. We had these giant uh, strandings of these Viela, wind of the sea, whatever they are called, jellies. Uh, many people may have even seen these. These are these pelagic red crabs that washed up on the beaches all over the place in Southern California. And we even had giant sharks and things coming in close to shore that we'd never had before. So there was a lot of disruption to our normal ecosystem. And we saw critters coming into the coast that had never been seen before. So just to go through a little more of the specifics of the things we saw, um, an important one was that it's actually something we couldn't see visually like the sharks and things. And that's that there was a big decrease in the amount of phytoplankton in both 2014 and 15. And that's important because phytoplankton is the sort of key element that feeds everything else in the food web. If you don't have food, phytoplankton, you don't have much else going on. But there was some other really noticeable effects. We had tuna swimming way far north, all the way up to the Copper River. We had these ocean sunfish and thresher shark, sharks caught off of Alaska. We had changes in the timing of the salmon that were coming back up at the Fraser River. There was a changes in what the birds were eating off British Columbia. Again, I said this about the wind jellies being washed up. We had die-offs. And of course, what many people in this area may have seen was the um, large number of uh, stranded marine mammals and lastly, we had a lot of uh, harmful algal blooms that occurred during that, those years. So these are a lot of really diverse and critical impacts that happened to our coastal ecosystem during that time. So I just wanna spend a little time talking more about why the sea lion pups in particular were hit so hard. Um, these are both the California sea lions and those Guadalupe fur seals, which are kind of like mini um, sea lions if you've never seen them and they're super cute. Um, so the question is, why were they hit so hard? Uh, I just want to talk about that for a minute. So what we're looking at here is kind of looks like crazy spaghetti, but the important thing about this is that the dots on this chart are giving you an idea of how similar the community of very, very small fish that are out there. It tells you how similar the different years are to each other. So if dots are close to each other, it says we had about the same numbers and kinds of small fish. Those are the fish we call the forage species. And forage species are important because they're one of the main prey items of sea lions and some of the larger fish that also sea lions eat. So they can both, these forage are eaten directly by sea lions or they're the prey for the food that sea lions eat. So there's a direct linkage here. The thing to note is that you'll see, I've circled it, that 2013, 14, 15, and 16 are these huge outliers that are way off the edge of the chart here compared to everything else. So what that means is that 
the community of these forage fish was very different from all the other years we have records for. And it's this change in the community that was caused by the heat wave, by the warm temperatures and somewhat different waters that came into the region that disrupted the food web leading to what happened with the sea lion pups. So essentially the mothers would go out and they would, uh, normally they take their sea lion pups to the shore and they leave them there just for a little bit while they go off to forage and bring back food. The mothers would leave their pups on the shore, head out to go get food and they wouldn't find what they wanted. And after a while of that, they give up and just swim all the way up to um, Oregon and Washington and Canada and, and strand the pups, leaving them behind to uh, essentially die. So that was, that was really what was happening. It was this disruption of the food web. Um, but there's this great paper, if you want to see more about the specific impacts, uh, I've listed it here, that kind of went through who the losers and winners were during a typical heat wave like this, this big blob. So one of the big ones, again, is these things that happen at the lower end of the food web. I'm going to switch to my laser pointer again so I can point things. Um, so one of, this is a really important part of this whole story, is that there was a change in these little microscopic plankton called copepods and krill there was a big change in what kinds of copepods were out there. And this had effects all up and down the entire food web. So we had a loss of these, the tasty fat copepods that come down from the north. We had changes in where the market squid were. We had a lot of the Dungeness crab and other mussel fisheries had to be closed during 15, uh, 14 I believe 15, due to um, toxicity from harmful algal blooms. We had changes in salmon recruitment. We had um, some loss of habitat for ground fish. Again, we had these big uh, die-offs of seabirds and then the seals and sea lions draining their pups. And even the baleen whales did poorly. Now, uh, when they wrote this article, they were talking about them doing poorly because of food, but it turns out the whales also were impacted because the normal corridor that they would swim north and south along the coast was kind of decreased in its offshore width. And so there was actually, they had to swim closer to shore and they were being hit a lot more by ships and running into nets. So we had a lot of whales that got killed um, due to ship strikes and other things because they were coming into areas they normally do to, normally would not come into to do their migrations. Um, now it's kind of weird to talk, well, were there winners during this time? Yeah, there was some winners. For instance, the toxic phytoplankton were a winner. I mean, it's not good for us or the fish, but it's good for the phytoplankton. Um, some of the copepods that live in tropical waters, they did well and expanded north. The market squid actually changed and went farther north. So um, some people that were fishing for them in the north, that was better for the fishermen and for the parts of their population. Oddly enough, some of the rockfish did fine during these years. We're not still not exactly sure why that's the case. Uh, and if anybody remembers the news articles from that time, people were overjoyed that they were catching tuna just off the coast rather than having to go in a ship for you know six, seven hours to go catch them way offshore. And then apparently orcas also increased their, uh, their uh, birth rates because there was more salmon in some of the regions that the orcas like to go to. Okay, so what causes these um, events, these blobs, these heat waves? So I'm gonna run through that for you. Okay, now this is, there's a lot in this diagram, so I'm gonna take some time to kind of break it down what's going on here. So I'm gonna walk through this. But essentially, we now know that most of these heat waves begin with a change in what's happening in the atmosphere over the surface of the ocean. And specifically what happens is um, we'll get a region, over, a very large region over the open ocean where the, the atmospheric pressure increases. And what happens when the atmospheric pressure increases is that it weakens the normal winds that would blow through that area. And in fact, it can essentially steer winds around uh, the area where the warming starts to begin. So it's steering the wind, it's decreasing the winds and it's steering them and the storms that usually come through, especially in the winter, it's steering them around the center of the, of the North Pacific. So that's kind of the first step. The second step is because we don't have the winds and we don't have the um, storms coming through, particularly in the winter time, what's called the mixed layer, which is this sort of surface of the ocean that normally would get stirred around, uh, like stirring up your coffee, it normally gets stirred around by those winds. Well, 
When it doesn't get stirred around by the winds, it becomes thinner and closer to the surface, and that lets it heat up more than it normally would. Okay, And then eventually, because the water heats up so much, it has a feedback back to the atmosphere that changes cloud cover and it adds more energy into the air, thus letting that pressure build up even more to reinforce the system over time. So it's kind of this positive feedback loop that kind of gets sort of runs away and keeps the heat wave going. So it's the winds, the, app, the pressure and the wind that eventually that originally started, but then it's the lack of winds and a buildup of pressure that maintain uh, these events over these long, long time periods. So that's essentially how these things form out there. Now, in the particular case of the blob, the big heat wave that we had in 2014-15, there was even more going on in that we believe the, the leading theory now is that there was this kind of oscillation between the atmospheric pressure that began the heat wave and the actual development of El Nino is what's referred to as ENSO on this figure. So basically what happened was in 2014, we had this high pressure, which ends up having some complicated forcing where it links up with what's happening on the equator. This is supposed to be the equator down here. And then eventually the changes in atmosphere and pressure and winds from the equator feed back to what's going on in the North Pacific. And that in turn further strengthens these events. And it just kind of kept going around and around in 14 and 15. So that's what, that's again, part of why this particular heat wave lasted so long. Okay, so just to summarize that, the blob itself and, and the other heat waves I'll show a little bit of, these things are caused by changes in atmospheric circulation, which are specifically the pressure modes, if you wanna find out more about that. Then there's also then following that changes in wind and the mixing. Then we have these large feedback loops between the North Pacific and the equator. Okay, and these are influenced by the El Nino cycle to some extent. Now, it's important to note though, that even though things are kind of looping around, not all El Ninos lead to blobs. And not all blobs will feed back to El Ninos, but there is actually a high probability that they do. Now, the extreme blob like the recent one also needs to have the right preconditioning and teleconnections. And these things are not always evident in these modes. So by preconditioning, I mean that there also has to be less winds than there normally might be. You have to have the less cloud cover than there normally might be. And often uh, it seems like we need to have that thinner mixed layer in order as a as a sort of precondition before the, the blobs and the heat waves will will begin. And then a lot of this is still again active research to understand these large atmospheric modes and how they connect to things going on in the equator and around the world to influence the heat waves we're seeing in our um, region. Okay. So the next question is besides this big blob that I've been talking about in 1415, have there ever been other similar large events uh, over time? How does this compare to other things we've seen? Okay, so the answer is yes. There have been some other events that rival the blob, but none of them have ever been as long. Now, there's a lot going on in this figure, I know, but I'll try to walk you through it for a second. The uh, horizontal axis here is, is how big these different heat waves were uh, at their maximum size. And you're reading this right. At its maximum size, the heat wave that began in 2013, uh, in fact, I labeled him with a number as to when it started, but actually this is the, the blob that lasted and on this vertical axis is how long. It lasted for approximately 757 days. It's just a whopper, okay? This thing lasted for 757 days and at its maximum size, it was covering 9.1 million kilometers squared. So that's something in the neighborhood of seven or eight times the size of Alaska. <laughs> so this is a giant event, okay? Now, has there anything that's even come close? In fact, the answer is yes, in terms of size. And these were the heat waves that we had, start one in 2019 and one in this very last year, 2020. These 
we had two separate heat waves that were nearly as big. One of them was 8.9 million kilometers squared. The other one was about 9 million kilometers squared. So almost the same size as the blob, these, these two very recent heat waves we had in the last two years. However, neither of these lasted very long. They only lasted about 220 or so days, and then they kind of decline. And I'll show some pictures of them as well. And then you'll notice that all the rest of this, these heat waves, in fact, I've been able to track about 211 heat waves over time. And the time period I've looked at is from 1982 until just about a week ago, actually. You can do these things almost in real time. But we did not have any satellites up that were the same kind of satellites reliably before 1982. So I really can only look at satellite data going back to 82. So this is as much data as we have right now to do this kind of analysis. Um, and so all the other heat waves that have ever happened are down in this area. They're sort of a poor uh, third compared to these recent events. Uh, one of the notable ones, though, of course, was there was a fairly large event that happened in 2004. It never reached the shore. Okay, so we really didn't make much of it at the time because it was far out off the coast and didn't, we don't think it had many impacts in coastal areas. And then you'll note for reference, an event that some people may remember, the 1997 El Nino, which was a huge event that had also had a lot of impacts, but you'll notice its size is probably about less than half of the size of these recent heat waves. So it's not nearly as big and it doesn't really last as long either as these recent heat waves. So these heat waves have huge impacts and are much larger in scale and scope than something like an El Nino. So I'm gonna take a little closer look at these most recent heat waves of 2019 and 2020. So again, this is these, these are these maps showing the North Pacific, the Northeast Pacific, and these, this, again, this is the anomaly plot. So this is how different the temperature is from the temperature it should be on that day. And you'll notice I've kind of outlined in a little blue dotted line here, I've, I've outlined what's called the, the US's uh, EEZ, -E -E the exclusive economic zone. So this is the region that we kind of claim all our fishing rights to is this region. And it's just kind of there for your reference. Uh, and it goes 200 nautical miles offshore. And so what I've done is I've shown you these plots for about the same time of year, September of 2014 during the blob, September of 2019 and September of 2020, just to, so you can see how these three events compare. And there's some small differences, but in general, all three of these are taking up most of the ocean, okay, at least in our region. But you'll notice something important is that all three of them, if you can see it, there's always still these little regions of blue along the coast. That's not including the dotted line, but there are some little regions of blue, and that's from the normal upwelling. So these events fortunately did not fully disrupt the normal upwelling, which is probably why if you remember earlier, I mentioned that some of the rockfish still seem to do okay during the blob in these recent years. And it's probably because even with the blob happening, there was still upwelling going on. Okay. One of the important differences though, to being down here in Southern California is if we look in a little more detail down in this little corner where we're located, where you can see my laser pointer, hopefully down at this little dot here, hopefully most people are familiar with that uh, map. And you'll notice the big difference in 2014, and it was similar in 2015, I just haven't showed the plot, there was a lot of warm water in this circle, okay? Now in 2019 though, for some reason, the blob never made it to this southern waters. There was a little bit of heating right in the shore, but most of the water stayed cool. And so um, we mostly suspect that there weren't the impacts on the sea lines that we had seen in previous years or the other impacts in the southern water. Still impacts, in these northern waters, but not as many impacts for the animals living in Southern California. And then this past year, it was kind of a mixed bag. We kind of had warm waters sort of off and on in our Southern region, but again, nothing like we had during 2014. So again, we don't think there was many impacts. One of the problems though, of course, is that this past year, particularly with COVID, our ability to go out and sample some of these things was very limited. So we may not have data to say exactly what happened uh, during 2020, unfortunately. Okay. And then the big other big difference between the blob and these two recent heat waves is what happened the, during the, the early spring or mid-spring mid following the big heat waves. 
So now what I've plotted is, again, these three time periods. So the spring after the first event here, here's the blob, but this is March, 2015. So at this point, we've had blob for a whole year, all of 2014, and then we're into the springtime. And then this is March of 2020. So this is essentially following up the springtime after the 2019 heat wave. And then this is the latest image I have for what's going on pretty much right now, following the 2020 event. And you can see there's a big difference here. The big one being that in the springtime, after the big blob, we still had hot waters all up and down the coast versus last year, 2020, the heat wave had pretty much shrunk and gone way offshore. This is about 2000 kilometers offshore. So way offshore and there's no wintertime impacts. And the same thing looks like it's happening this year, although can't say for sure. But again, the pattern is that this big warm blob of water is retreating from the coast and shrinking to the offshore region. So we, we're not expecting too many impacts um, this coming year, but we'll see. We don't know yet if another one could again reform. Okay, so just to summarize this part, what was different about these events, the blob versus these two most recent years? Well, again, the blob stuck around for over two years. Okay, these two recent events, they lasted from spring through the following January but they dissipated to offshore during the late spring. And that's important because springtime is when a lot of the fish are spawning and doing all the things they normally like to do in the spring when there's a big uh, increase in productivity. So that's really important for a lot of the food web that there was not these impacts during the springtime. Okay. Then again, the 2019 and 2020 heat waves didn't have as nearly as much heating specifically off of Southern California. So we don't think there was many impacts there. And it turns out, I didn't show any graphs to back this up, but we have some data that says that these 2019 and 2020 events were much more shallow and they reached maybe only 40 to 75 meters deep in the water. Whereas we know that the blob actually heated the water all the way down to 100, sometimes 120 meters deep in some places of the ocean. So the depth to which these heat waves penetrate was quite different between these different years. So there's some differences, some similarities, okay? So onto my last section here, the $10 million question. Are these heat waves, are these gonna be the new normal? So what is the evidence we have? We have basically five out of the last seven years. So 2014, 15, somewhat in 16, and then now 2019 and 2020, five of these last seven years have had these unprecedented heat waves compared to the data that we have going back to 1982. And that's a lot of heat waves to have all in a small period of time. So it's very tempting to say yes, but excuse me, there are some important caveats. Okay. So one thing we don't know is we don't know how variable the ocean was back in 1982 at the same kind of time scales that we have now due to modern satellites. Okay, so this is important because, oops, this is important because. It's not quite a long enough time series, really, even though it's almost 40 something years. It's not really a long, time, a long enough time series to be conclusive about these recent events if we do statistics on the data. And that's always important to do statistics to show for sure that this is something new. Also, we haven't really had enough events in this recent time period, which also affects, again, the statistics of trying to make these kind of conclusions. So there's we really at this point need to wait and see for another couple of years if the, we keep having the events, then we might be able to say, yes, this is a new trend or not. Now, the second caveat is actually just sort of a technical one, and it has to do with my, goes all the way back to the beginning of this talk as to what we say is the threshold for a heat wave. So what I've drawn here is some actual uh, sea surface temperature data, SST is sea surface temperature, and I'm showing it over time from 1982 to actually last week. Um, and this is for one specific little point I picked out from some random spot in the middle of the North Pacific, okay? And what you're seeing here is the red line is the threshold for saying what is a heat wave. So whenever the black line goes above the red line on here, that's when we say it's a heat wave, okay? So here's the problem. We know from this data that there's been a long-term 
change in the background ocean temperature. And this is the long-term trend in ocean temperature. And I've put the dotted line there to show that. It's, it's gradual, but it is there. It's slightly sloping up to the right-hand side here. And that dashed line, that is essentially climate change. That is the long-term ocean warming that is happening in the ocean. And we have very good statistics to say that is for sure happening. So the problem is if you, if you follow what's going on here, if you track this dotted line to the right, it's sloping up, but the top one, the threshold is not because just based on the way we calculate this number, eventually those lines intersect and you would say, hey, wait a minute, everything's gonna be a heat wave, even though it's just the background temperature. So that's a big problem, okay? And what we can do is we can remove this long-term trend from the data and then say, well, is it still the case that we're having more of these heat waves, more times when these spikes are going up above the line in recent times than in the past if we remove the long-term trend? And that's what I've done in this plot. So now I've taken out the long-term trend. So this dotted line, which is the average over time is now completely flat at zero, okay? And we now look to see, all right, are there still more times where the, the spikes are popping up above the line? And it looks like that is the case. But again, we need a little bit more time, maybe another five to 10 years of these events before we can statistically be very sure that this is really what's happening, that it might be a new, uh, a new change and we're having more heat waves. So, this is important because it says that if we remove that long-term trend, it actually somewhat decreases the strength of recent events and increases the strength of past events. However, the most recent events still remain vast outliers. And so um, I just wanna show you a little cartoon here just to try to drive this point home about the difference between uh, these heat waves, which is you know, sort of higher frequency variability and how that interacts with um, long-term uh, climate change and ocean warming. So imagine here's this little man and he's gonna be walking up this hill, okay? And we can think of the hill as being the ocean temperature over time. And the slope of this hill is essentially the long-term ocean warming that we're seeing, okay? Now, imagine if you could, that there's some boulders on the hill that we have to walk over as we walk up the hill. And these boulders are analogous to our heat waves that are happening over time, okay? So here's the problem. As we walk up the hill, unfortunately, the way we do it right now, we define the threshold as being this sort of constant value based on this long-term data set. And so every time you go over a boulder and your head goes above this little dotted line here, that's, that's when you say, okay, now it's a heat wave. So the question becomes, well, you know, just because we've got this background slope doesn't, and we're getting, and we're gonna, as we walk up the hill, every time we go over a boulder, it's more often that our head goes over the top of this line. But that doesn't necessarily mean that there's any more boulders now than there ever was before. And it doesn't mean that the boulders are bigger than they were before. We don't know that yet. Okay, so that's essentially our problem is in the future, we're gonna need to figure out new ways to decide are the boulders actually bigger or more frequent than they used to be in the past? Or is it just somewhat the background trend, okay? So getting close to wrapping up here, I just wanted to show this plot. Again, this is the same data as I showed earlier, showing how big the heat waves have been versus how long they lasted. But in this version of it, I took out that background warming just to show you the difference. And the difference, again, is not super obvious. We still have that the big blob during 2013, now it actually got split up a little bit and it starts in 14 when you do this version, but it's still very long, over a year long. And it still is the largest event, these heat waves that started in 2014, followed closely by 2019. And on this one, 2020 got lost, but it would actually be right here where my laser pointer is. So the trend remains the same. Even if we take out that long-term warming, those, these recent couple heat waves are still whoppers that had big impacts and are very noticeable outliers. Okay, so just to conclude, I'd say it's a little early yet to say that the heat waves are the new normal, but it's tempting. Uh, even with, because even with the removal of the long-term climate signal, these re recent events really still stand out. They just don't stand out quite as much, but they still stand out, okay? Heat waves have large impacts across most of the California current ecosystem. And we're likely to get more of these heat waves and we're likely to have more impacts. And then this last point is kind of important because 
you know, even though I've kind of talked about this problem with the how we set these thresholds, to the to many of the fish and other animals we have out there, it doesn't matter to them what the threshold is. Because for them, if the absolute temperature goes over some set temperature that they don't like, well, then they just plain old don't do well. And it doesn't matter what our definition is. It really matters what the fish's definition is of what's an unacceptable temperature. So that's really one of the things we need to key in now, now on is looking at different species up and down the coast of fish, mammals, whatever, plankton, and see how they individually respond to these changes in temperature. It's not gonna be a one size fits all, one type of heat wave, heat wave impacts all things the same. It's gonna impact them differently. And our job is to break this down and see how it impacts these different uh, parts of the ecosystem. And that's all, I thank you. Uh, and if you're interested, I've posted a, um, a link to a website where I keep a sort of running uh, blog about heat waves. I kind of have uh, sometimes weekly when there's a lot of things happening. Sometimes it's more like monthly if not much is happening, but I keep a, 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 a blob tracker essentially that gives you an update about what the latest is going on with heat waves. And you can find um, all the animations and most of the figures I've showed tonight are also located there. And you can find movies of the heat waves for every single year from 1982 until now if you want to see what those look like. And uh, that's that's all. I'm happy to take questions and I'll stop sharing my screen. Thank you. I'm going <laughs> to clap for you. And every, I know everyone else is clapping too. Sure. Um, I, there's a lot of uh, thank yous in the chat. And um, a lot of people really enjoyed that. Thanks, Andy. That was great. Um, OK, so there, yeah, everyone is starting to put their questions in the Q&A. Um, there were a few, and now there's a bunch more. So let's let's see how many we can get through. Yeah. Um, let's see. So um, this one, um, you touched a little bit on this, but um, has there been any work done on the effects of that the 2019-2020 heat waves on marine species? Have you guys had a chance to to look look at that yet? We have we have not compiled a lot of the data. So 2019, we have some uh, evidence. Uh, mostly the impacts we saw there was um, in the north, in Washington and Oregon, it actually did impact the uh, shell fisheries there. And I think uh, possibly Dungeness crab might have been affected that year as well. I'm not totally sure on that. But uh, that, and that was because um, we, there seems to be a good linkage between when the warm water comes in in the fall and the presence of a diatom that causes a toxin. Uh, it's mostly this thing called pseudonychia that produces domoic acid, and that gets into the shellfish. So that was one of the notable impacts. Um, I believe there was also some changes in some of the uh, salmon numbers returning uh, those years. Uh, but in most cases, the impacts in 2019 and somewhat in 2020 were more limited to um, the fall and more towards Washington and Oregon, because that's actually where the heat wave uh, came right into shore and was on shore for several months in the fall those years. So uh, the rest of the, the area was not as impacted. Yeah. Okay, uh, Randall has an interesting question. Um, is there a relationship with the Pacific Decadal Oscillation? And a follow-up, um, are there cold waves? <laughs> <laughs> Let me do the cold waves first. Okay. So. Cold waves is very interesting, and um, there, there. I have not looked into cold waves yet, but I do know that someone has a. There is a paper out there on cold waves, so I might be able to uh, scratch it up and, and post it somewhere. But um, it's interesting because, if from a technical sense, most of what I do is is a computer program that goes filters through the data, and all I would actually have to do is change a couple of positives to negative, and it would do the exact same thing and track cold waves. I just haven't, haven't done it, but it totally can be done because you would use the same data and the same methods. Uh, but no, I, 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 uh, I think there's maybe one paper where someone speculated about it, but mostly we're not looking at that. Um, the reason being that um, we have basically the background warming of the ocean, right? So we know that the overall situation is that things are just getting, plain old getting warmer everywhere. So we're not really expecting an increase in cold waves, but that's a, that's a really interesting question. 
Uh, now the PDO, um, that's a difficult one to answer because in the different years when we've had heat waves, the PDO has showed values that are sometimes seems like there's a connection where we'll have a, a positive PDO during a heat wave. And then other times it'll be negative. And my feeling on this is that because of the way the PDO is calculated, the, the heat waves are actually disrupting the normal, what we think of as being a positive or a negative uh, value of the PDO and, how, and, and just what that value equates to. So I, I have not seen too much evidence. On the other side though, if you look at that paper I showed um, by DiLorenzo and Mantua, uh, they actually, sh I believe, show some connection to a slightly different climate signal called the NPGO, which is the North, North Pacific Gyre Oscillation Index. And that is um, got some relation to the PDO. So if you want to get into the details of that, I recommend uh, checking out that paper. But there is there does seem to be some connection with that atmospheric mode and the uh, heat waves. Okay, sorry, it's a, that's a little bit of a technical <laughs> answer. <laughs> But it's, yeah, it's, that's, yeah, the exact connections are still something that, that people are working on. I'm, I do the ocean part. I am, I have to say, I'm not an atmospheric specialist. So that's, that's what I know about it. So I refer you to, to Di Lorenzo and, uh, and Mantua for uh, further explanation. Okay, um, well, here's an animal question um, okay. from Mary. Do we see a movement of species of fish to the north to compensate for the increase in ocean temperature? Yes, but it varies by species. So some species can do that. Um, in fact, anchovies definitely did. Probably the sardine did. Uh, but some species like rockfish and other species, they don't like to move, right? Rockfish like to sit. I mean, they're old. Some of these rockfish, what, are like 40? even 100 years old, and they sit in the same spot their whole life. So they pick a spot, they stay there, they don't move. So they can't really move, they, they are stuck. And so it, it totally depends on the, on the species of fish. Now, big, the big, huge fish, like tunas and all those things, they definitely move. I mean, that was the whole thing. We started realizing something crazy was going on, actually first from fishermen who were saying, my God, I just caught a skipjack tuna in Alaska. And there was, you know, I, people seeing the pictures of, of bears in Alaska eating Humboldt squid, giant Humboldt squid, right? They never go up that far because they, they can't go in the cold, but it was so warm they were going up way up north. So the so a lot of the really big fish and things were moving up north and even some of the smaller things were moving north. Um, so yes, definitely they, they changed their uh, distribution uh, because of the warm waters, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, um, here's another question, another animal question, one that I'm really interested in. Kendra wants to know, um, was the blob responsible for sea star wasting disease? I have, I have no idea. I do not know. That's a great question. I do not, I don't know. I, yeah. It's it's something um, that we've been working on at Cabrillo. We have a long-term study and um, we've used a lot. Of, I didn't even realize it was your data, Andy. We've used a lot of your data to correlate to our sea star um, uh, presence absence data that we oh, have okay. and there's definitely um, a relationship with um, increased temperature and PTO and um, decreases in sea stars and yeah. we can relate the decrease in sea stars to the wasting um, syndrome. Interesting. So, um, Interesting. Yeah it's something that we're um, we're working on um, gathering all the data. We have over 40 years of data that we want to publish. So we do that soon. Okay, uh, let's find another question. Um, here's one from Mary. What causes the change in atmospheric circulation that gets the blob started? Okay, that, again, that is probably related to the large scale, like what's called atmospheric modes and it's something that happens across the entire Pacific. So it's related to those, what's called teleconnections between what's actually happening on the equator and sort of the circulation as the air masses, they, they actually rotate and sort of both conveyors belts that go vertically and move horizontally and shift the atmospheric um, patterns of pressure. Now, you know, is it the butterfly that flaps its wings in South America and 
chain reaction up through, I don't know, but the, the atmospheric dynamics are one of the hardest things to um, predict and model. So I, as, as far as what kicks those things off in the first place, it's not, I don't think it's clear um, really to anyone. And in fact, even our best computer models that try to predict the atmospheric circulation completely blew it when it came to the blobs. So we were watching the blob form, we were watching the atmosphere change, and the model was saying, no, 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 that's not happening. The best computer models we had were all, and there's a bunch of them, we're all saying, no, 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 it's gonna, it's gonna cool off, it's not gonna go, it's not gonna happen, we're gonna have an El Nino instead, and that's not what happened. So um, we are unfortunately behind on the physics of predicting the atmosphere and how that works. So that's still open research right now. Yeah. Um... See, here's one. Here, I'll go to that. The very first one. Jody had a question about um, something that happened in Monterey. Um, so it's a little long. So let me just get through this. Um, in Monterey Bay, we had a boom of anchovies in major numbers, never before seen in the bay. So the humpbacks came into shore following the forage fish. Can you put that into perspective? Originally, we were told that anchovies prefer cold water. The temperatures inside the bay were significantly higher than normal. It doesn't say when that happened, but um, yeah, yeah, no, no, I totally, I, yeah, I, I've heard of this story. So, okay. um, the deal with anchovies is that, yes, sure, they were warm in the bay, but they were still way colder than everywhere else outside of the bay. So, it was like some of their, they were basically folding in on their last little refuges to go to along the coast, the anchovies. Uh, and so that was what was going on, but it was also, um, the bay was a unique case. It was actually warm right in the bay, but in the region surrounding the mouth of the bay, it actually stayed cool in some of those areas. So I think you were just getting some spillover from the very close coastal region that were still a little bit cold. Remember I mentioned that during, even during the big blob uh, and these recent years, there was still these little patches of what we call upwelling that was bringing cold water with nutrients and things. There, that was still occurring and these, they were patchy, but it was happening all summer long during 14 and 15. And so there were these, were these little refuges. And I think that's where the anchovies and some of these other things were, were basically their last refuge they were going to. So um, indeed, we saw some record number of anchovies in various locations along the coast. And that was most likely they were being compressed down to these little refuges that they were, they were going into. Um, at least that, that's one theory. Uh, again, we unfortunately didn't have good sampling um, even during the blob years, because normally we don't sample that close to shore for the anchovies and sardines, because that's not usually where they are. Our big um, sampling uh, system that we use to look for these things is always focused much further offshore in the Southern California region and not to the north and not that close to shore. So it's possible we just missed uh, some of the sampling of these things. But um, yeah, I think hopefully that answers the question, I think. Yeah, I think so. It was very interesting what happened there. Um, here's a question from Erin. Um, her nickname's Fish Queen, Erin. Um, can, you, can you speak a little bit about how upwelling might mitigate the effects of um, marine heat waves? Since we are an eastern boundary upwelling system and SST um, is one of the main drivers of marine heat waves, yep. our environments may be protected for longer than in open ocean environments. Absolutely. So we saw we like I was I think I was actually just kind of mentioning that. So we definitely saw places and periods where the up upwelling was strong enough to essentially push the heat wave back offshore. Okay. But the thing is, the normal cycle of upwelling, it's not like upwelling doesn't just keep pumping constantly all up and down the shore. I mean, sometimes it does. 2013 was a crazy year. 2013, if you look at the maps, of temperature, it was cold up and down the whole coast all summer long. The upwelling was just pumping. It was just crazy, okay, all the time. But that's not normal either. Normally what you have is the winds kind of actually going about a five to seven day cycle where it blows for a while, the wind blows, and that causes the upwelling, moves the water offshore. You bring up the cold water from down deep. But then we have this period called upwelling relaxation for a day or two where the wind often changes direction or slows down. And that lets that warm water come back in the shore. And that's kind of what we saw. Uh, and if you look at maps of the ocean temperatures and the local winds right along various regions of the coast, you can definitely see the connection between the sort of local scale upwelling and these periods of cold water. 
And normally what would happen during the summer is you wouldn't have that big mass of really hot water continually slamming back and back and back into the coast every time there was a sort of upwelling relaxation. Um, but definitely, yes, the upwelling can mitigate it to some extent. And again, we can point to um, some of the rockfish that did fine even during the blob years because they were still, they happened to be in a lucky spot where there was plenty of cold water coming up. Now, if things keep going like they're going though, we do note that there has been an increase in what we call stratification. And that is how the difference between the temperatures at the surface and at some depth. And we have noticed there has been some increase in that stratification. So as stratification increases, meaning that there's a more of a difference between the cold water down deep and the warm water surface, even when the wind blows really strong on that warm water surface, if it's really heavily stratified, the stuff from down below can't get up. And so that is worrisome that if stratification continues to increase uh, due to the subsequent heat wave after heat wave after heat wave, it may be that eventually upwelling will not be as effective at bringing up the nutrients and cooling coastal waters. So that's something we're uh, working on right now is to see if that if that's also happening. Okay, um, here's um, something from Marie. She's, um, she's asking, could melting of the poles contribute to cooling of the oceans in the future? Maybe you could talk a little bit about. <laughs> um, unfortunately, that goes the other way, believe it or not. <laughs> so um, that's a whole nother lecture. That's the doom and gloom scenario. Um, so uh, unfortunately, as the, as the poles melt, okay, they change what's called the thermohaline circulation. And normally uh, forming ice at the poles is really important because what happens is as ice forms out of seawater, as the seawater turns into ice, what happens is ice does not like to have salt in it. So normally as, as it gets colder and the ice is forming, it kicks out the little bits of salt. And when you kick bits of salt out of the ice as it forms, the water gets denser. Okay, and so that water is very cold and becomes dense. And so as the ice forms, the water kind of goes towards it and then that water sinks. And it starts a giant ocean conveyor belt that takes that cold water to the deep and then eventually brings it up at the equators. And that cools, actually cools the equator, okay? So forming ice at the poles helps to balance the heat budget of the earth by rotating this giant conveyor belt. What happens is, at the point someday when we stop forming ice at the poles, we shut down some of that circulation. And so what happens is then we could have, who knows what happens, it's like the movies, you know, some horrible apocalypse, <laughs> but we no longer start redistributing the heat properly north and south of the ocean. So it kind of ends up going the other way and makes the equator heat up a lot more. And the poles could then actually flip flop and go back the other way and cool down or just stay warm also. But it's not really clear exactly what will happen. But um, yeah, unfortunately the melting of the ice will not, will not help. <laughs> yeah, I love the way you explained that. That was, that was really good. Um, okay, um, let's see. Um, can you talk a little bit about how these data were, were the temperature data, how it was collected? How do you, how does NOAA get the temperature data? Ah, okay. So it's from, it's all, everything I showed you, most of it, I think all of it actually is from satellites. Okay. So there's a, a couple different satellites that whip around the globe uh, and they give us enough data to then um, see basically the ocean and the resolution is one quarter, about one quarter of a degree. Although we do have some satellites to do one eighth of a degree. So when I say a degree, I mean a degree of latitude longitude. So that's the sort of spatial um, distance we look at uh, for these particular satellites. So they, they're spinning, flying around the earth. They, they're going really fast and they eventually, it takes them only a day or two to cover almost the entire uh, earth's oceans. Uh, and then, We've had, it's not the same satellite that's been there since 82, but we've had almost the same kind of uh, instruments on different satellites over that period of time from about 1982 till now. Uh, so uh, that's, I mean, that's primarily it is these satellites. So the data comes down to a NOAA center where folks quality control it and uh, massage it. And they actually do some work to make sure that the 
numbers that come from the satellite match up with where we do have ground data. So where we have buoys and other, and ships that have taken data, they take the data from the satellite and they ground truth it with actual data that's being sampled by you know, real instruments in the water and make sure that it all makes sense and it's correct. And then they release that data out and I'm able to go online and I just shoop, suck it up into my computer program and run my blob tracker and away I go. So <laughs> that's, that's pretty much the process, yeah. That's so cool. Um, okay, uh, my follow-up question, somebody just anonymous just, just asked it as well. Um, where do you get your animal data? Uh, the animal data comes from many different sources. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm part of the federal government. So we deal with the ocean that is three miles offshore and further. So we have our own ships that go out and sample the animals. Um, we have a robust system that does that usually two to four times a year off of Southern California. It's called the Cal Coffee Program. Uh, it's jointly run by the Southwest Fisheries and uh, and Scripps Institution of Oceanography. Um, so we do that. It takes a month or so to do the sampling. So they're out there almost two to four months a year, a whole huge crew of people collecting these animals. Uh, we also get data from um, from fishermen, from people, fisher people, people fishing. Uh, whoever's out there, we have observers that go on their boats that give us data. We They also self-report a lot of the data. Uh, we get data from their landings when they bring it into shore. Uh, and then we also have um, surveys that are conducted by our sort of uh, our joint version of our office, but up in Seattle uh, and Alaska, we have NOAA offices off and down the coast that do similar sampling, similar sampling programs. Uh, we also then, we also use some state data. So uh, the state uh, um, wildlife departments all do sampling in some of their waters and some of the fish, like for instance, salmon, are managed both by state and federal together because they go on up the rivers and then they go out to the ocean. So we get some numbers also from um, state agencies. Uh, but the bulk of things I was talking about was mostly data collected by um, by researchers in uh, San Diego. Cool. Uh, no. yeah. um, okay, um, I got another question. Um, what What do you think about the the time in between each blob, the the frequency of time, um, how does that um, affect each like major groups of animals in order to be able to recover? Like if you know how how much time is not enough time for right. um, certain groups to not recover from the change in heat so uh, so abruptly. Yeah, that so that is again a super open question. We don't we don't so some species we know, and then there's a lot of species where we don't know. And the problem is that even um, even very what would seem to be seemingly highly related fish that like almost you couldn't even tell apart might have very different responses to temperature. Okay, so you you can't always predict if you've got one kind of you know, drum fish or something or bass or something, you can't say, well, it has this response to temperature. And so this other bass might have similar temperature. No, it can't do that. It's usually um, quite variable species to species. And that's, that's open, open research right now topic is to understand all these animals responses to temperatures. Uh, yeah, so that's, that's ongoing research. Um, unfortunately, a lot of us haven't been doing the research, that kind of research, because we can't be in the lab. So for our our organization, we haven't been in the labs for the last year almost doing some of those kinds of researches because it's just it's been safe because of COVID. Um, so that that kind of puts a squeeze on it a little bit, but um, yeah, that, that's a problem right now. But yeah, it, it's it's ongoing research to answer that. Yeah, and I I imagine it's, it would vary hugely depending on the life cycle of yes. every animal. Right. Um, there's still more questions coming in. We still got a big, sure. uh, a big group of people still watching. So um, let's see. Jasmine um, is asking, um, "Are you doing okay, Andy? You got a, you got time for a few more?" Oh, absolutely, yeah. Okay. Um, Jasmine um, is asking uh, related to your three mile answer. Um, uh, um, can you explain what's considered international waters? And so, does NOAA not oversee international waters? Oh boy. Um, <laughs> no, I can't answer that. Honestly, I, I'm, 
I'm not, I'm not on the policy end. I'm on the <laughs> basic research end. So all all I know is that we I, I'm not completely sure. Honestly, I can't I can't give a, a full clear answer on that. I know we have our you know what we call the exclusive economic zone where we do monitor and control most of what gets caught in that 200 nautical miles. Um, but as to I, I I I can't tell you where international starts. If, um, I think you could you she could Google. What yeah, are I'm sorry. Are yeah, that's I'm I'm not on the policy end. I'm on I'm a a, a basic researcher. So okay. we have a whole other we have a whole other office. It's actually here in 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 Long Beach that deals with that, and that's not me. <laughs> so, sorry. Okay, uh, Mary Mary wants to know: Do blobs affect heat waves on land? Ah, good question. Actually, mm -hmm. definitely they could affect the heat waves on land because, um, and it's not, I wouldn't, I don't know as much as if it's saying the blob is affecting what's on land, but the same atmospheric patterns that drive these blobs and reinforcements, reinforce them. So that, that um, big system of high uh, air pressure that helped form the blobs in the first place, that definitely affects the storm tracks and air pressure over the land. Uh, regions of the of the entire US. So definitely that affects it. Now, in terms of could the blob then be affected what's happening over land, it could because if you remember that one part, I was talking about how at a certain point there's these um, feedbacks where the warm water actually feeds and into the atmosphere and, and helps keep the atmosphere heated. And that helps maintain that atmospheric pressure. And having a big high atmospheric pressure here over the water is going to affect whether it's low or high somewhere else, quite far away, even over the land. So yes, you can definitely have some atmospheric um, feedbacks. What's not clear to me is whether there's a direct feedback, like say you've got this super warm water right up against the coast. I don't, I don't know enough to know if that um, would, like at a very local level, lead to warmer air right there in that region or not. Um, that I don't know, but I know that at the very large scales, definitely. It, it can have some impact, yeah. Okay, um, one, uh, two more. Uh, one just popped in that um, I think you can answer pretty quickly. Um, anonymously, someone asked, is there enough data to, data to predict when the next major blob will happen? No, <laughs> there is not. Oh, you can answer we, that. Do, we, do have, we do have some theory and we think it, they are related to changes in atmospheric modes over the equator. So we're watching that very carefully to see if that relationship holds. But it's not, um, it's not, that's like cutting edge work right now uh, that, is, that is trying to develop those relationships. Um, so yeah, that's where we don't, we have theory, but we don't have enough data yet to make those, to make that kind of um, prediction. And like I said, the models aren't doing very good at trying to predict them either. Um, they did a little bit better this last year uh, than they had in previous years, but the models, the, the atmospheric ocean models that we can run forward, say three to six months ahead to try to make some predictions, they do okay with with parts of the ocean, but they still aren't doing very good on heat waves. Okay, um, so let's just wrap it up with um, this last question about um, what are some some uh, significant things that people can do to um, try to alleviate this, alleviate climate change, or just, um, I, I mean, I, I like to, I like to wrap up things with um, good take-home messages. What, what, what are some things that people can do to uh, try to help the environment? Things that people could do. Um, Vote. <laughs> sure. Yeah, vote. <laughs> Definitely vote is my number one answer to that. Always um, think carefully about uh, whether the people you're voting for are thinking about climate. Think about whether the people you're voting for are supporting basic science, and uh, and whether the people you're voting for are following the advice of scientists. That would be the number one thing probably more important than anything else um, you could do of course we do know that most of this warming is from uh, man-made sources there's very little debate about that uh, now of any kind and it's most most universally accepted among scientists that the climate is warming and that we're causing it 
Uh, I don't think there's much question of that. So um, whatever you can do to decrease your carbon footprint, your greenhouse gas emissions, uh, those, those would be things that you could do on your own local level to uh, your own personal level to, to help. Um, but really it's, it's gonna take not only all of our personal efforts, but it's gonna take um, political will to make big change, some big changes too. Uh, I'm glad to see California is moving in the direction of having all electric, I forget what date it is, right? But we're supposed to have all electric cars by some date. I believe that's the latest on that. Um, so yeah, and support the Marine Mammal Center, I guess is the other one. So if, if anybody doesn't know, there's, it's right there in San Pedro and it's great to go take a look at the, well, great and not great to see the poor little sea lions that those guys rescue. So um, yeah, yeah support them. Good, uh, yeah. If you're looking to, to support, um, that's a good place. Yeah, they're, yes. they're, they rehabilitate and release as much as they can. Yeah, and they did a phenomenal job during the uh, during the, the big heat wave and in in, uh, in in taking care of what they could. They were at max capacity, I know, for months and months and months dealing with all the all this, the um, the sea lion pups they got in. So yeah, they did a great job. Okay, well, um, we'll, we'll we'll conclude there. Um, there's there's a ton of um, thank yous in the chat to you, Andy, and. Um, a lot of people saying what what a great talk and a lot of really good information and um i'd like to thank all the viewers again there's a lot of familiar names i can see in the particip participants so um i miss seeing you all um, in person um someday we will be able to be back in our john Ogeen lecture hall and have our discovery lectures live in person um, but um, I would again like to thank our speaker, Dr. Andy Lysing. Um, thanks again to the Friends of Kaboom and Aquarium, and thanks to the City of Los Angeles for their support. Um, we apologize if we couldn't get to all the questions. There are a few more popping in right now, but um, time's kind of running out. So um, I would like to remind everybody that um, our upcoming lecture is on Friday, April 9th. 2021, um, same time, 7 p.m. And it's uh, Dr. David Cummings from Point Loma Nazarene University. And he'll be um, talking about just say no to drugs, the spread of antibiotic resistant bacteria in our coastal wetlands. And then after that, we'll have a talk in June, on June 4th. Um, and the speaker is yet to be um, confirmed. More information can be found on Kaburum and Aquarium's website, and we have recorded this lecture, and we'll post it on our website soon, so um, you can share it um, with um, anybody that missed it. We'll, we'll have it in our archive section, and so um, thank you again for joining us. Um, stay safe. I uh, hope to see you next time, and good night.